Please welcome the director, Jennifer Peden. Um, so Jennifer, you had made films um, on Everest before about uh, climbers, and talk to us about the, the, how this film began. Um, so probably over a 10 year period, um, I've been working as a high altitude director and camera operator in the Himalayas. Um, I made one of my own films, but I've mainly been working on other people's films as a as a camera operator and, and that kind of thing. And, and so over the years, I, I got to know the Sherpas really well and um, and saw how much it hurt them every time they hit the cutting room floor of all of these other Everest movies. And um, the very first film I did actually was about the Sherpas. And so it was almost, a, it was a decade or if not 11 years on that I finally decided and managed to get back there to, to do this film that I kind of wanted to do for quite a long time. And so you set out to make a film about uh, Sherpas and, and maybe it would have been the 22nd ascent of, of, of Purva. Purvatashi, yeah. Um, and so when this tragedy took place, you know, what did you think was going to happen with your film? Did you think your film was, was over? Did you kind of immediately recognize maybe another film was taking place? You know, it's kind of hard. It's changing moment to moment, and I honestly didn't know that we had a film until, um, well, probably when Pervatashi said, I'm going to quit climbing, and I knew we really meant it. I thought, okay, maybe we have a film, but that wasn't until weeks after the avalanche. You know, so I just felt at the time that, you know, as you, I guess you do as a documentary filmmaker, you just kind of, you just keep running with the story. You know, there was a couple of days there where I wasn't really sure quite what we should do, and then we just decided to film as much as we could, cover as much of what was going on as possible, and, you know, it kind of reached the point where the Sherpas were coming to our camp to find us, to talk to us, and um, at that point it felt like, okay, they want this to happen and continue, so let's let's just keep filming what we could. I mean, remembering half of what was going on, I didn't know what was being said. So it was really in the edit when, you know, it took a couple of months to get all these things really properly translated, and. And there were some real revelations in those translations. Um, so it was kind of relief, a lot of it relief to know that we had good content. So uh, you shared with me that uh, there had been some screenings that have taken place uh, in Nepal uh, of uh, uh, four, four Sherpas uh, seen this film. What have you heard about those screenings, how people reacted to them? Well, first of all, so um, our amazing cinematographer, who was also credited as high altitude director, just because he's so amazing and his work really lifted the film um yeah, Osterk, yeah. Um, he was going over just by chance um right when we kind of locked the cut on another shoot to nepal and he said well i can take a copy over so i was still doing sound post and and couldn't go but he showed the the, the sherpas and the crew and pervatashi's family and both parents were still alive they've both since died so i was really you know, thrilled that they got to see it and, and we got that endorsement really early on and, and some of them came, I've been in LA um, for some screenings and I've had Sherpa's, Sherpa's wives in particular coming up and, and hugging me like they really, um, they really like the film and that's, that's a relief, frankly, yeah. Uh, the answer to that is not yet, but probably the specific person you're referring to had it said <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not looking forward to that. But um, you know what always surprises me in documentary, how you think people are going to hate it? And then Russell Bryce has seen the film, for example, and um, I mean, I'd known Russell for a long time. He gave me my start as a climbing camera operator, you know, before I even knew it was a thing. And um, people have very particular points of view and perspectives and he said it's tough but fair and I really love it and most there's quite a number now because we have been doing a lot of festivals and a number of the clients have been able to see it I've asked them what he what they think he'll think and they'll say I'll just be happy he's in it you know <laughs> yeah so what that was is it's a the two Sherpa cameramen that we trained, Nawang and Nima, they, on the day, so as you saw, we filmed them leaving through the night, then they had the cameras, plus they had GoPros. 
and they turn on the GoPros when there was enough light. And I think it was Narwang captured, it was a smaller snow avalanche, so it wasn't the avalanche, it was on the icefall on the day that it happened, as you probably understood from the film, there are lots of little avalanches all the time going on the icefall. And that was just something that we captured. And as you can see, it, it cuts the black and then it's sound design. And that's just the way that we decided to creatively depict the avalanche because we didn't capture it. Our Sherpa team were 50 metres above <coughs> when it happened, thank goodness. Um, the answer to that question, I think only Russell Bryce could answer. I have talked to him about it and there's a line in the film that um, a, a guy called Summit Joshi says, I think the Sherpas knew in their heart what their, the leaders, sorry, the leaders knew in their heart what their Sherpa wanted, but they couldn't tell that clearly to their clients. And to me, that's what happened. There was a lot of rumors going around base camp. Again, I had the benefit of going around and, and checking those out, also with a bunch of you know highly connected journalists that know those people. All of those rumors <coughs> turned out not to be true. Um, I believe when Purvatashi scoffed at the idea, he, he literally did scoff, and that's when I knew, hang on, this, these rumours aren't real. As to whether or not Russell believed them and didn't feel he could risk the clients, uh, or the Sherpas, rather, um, I, I, can, I can never really know that, because I mean, Russell will know, and I tried to get into a bunch of meetings, he cut me out of them. There was a lot of closed tent door discussions going on between <laughs> expedition leaders and... Um, it was all very mysterious, but I think, you know, in defense of Russell, I'd say he had a tough couple of years on Everest, and um, that's the way he chose to deal with it. Um, to be honest, I would have to say is when we returned to the villages and we had this, I remember Renan and I and, and our translator was, were, we'd been to one of the pujas for one of the the killed Sherpas from that village. And we'd taken money and given money and, and in the end I'd stay back because I didn't want to crowd the space and Renan just said it was the most difficult experience. And then I felt that we then really needed to do the same thing with the other family and we went to the other family and he and I went in and the translator knocked on the door and said, oh, moving at home and started walking away and then the father came to the door and said, please, please, please come in because he knew the translator and he invited us in and I think we all just sat there crying for half an hour. It was just, you know, it was, you see that beautiful young woman who's just had the baby. And, you know, there was, for me, it was a moment of, am I being an ambulance chaser here? Or is this, do people need to see this? Is, you know, and so then in the end, we didn't film for a very long time. And at the end, they said, please, if you need to film, we want people to know this story. And so they kind of invited us to, because I just didn't know if it was the right thing to do. So for me, that was, by far the most difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been talking to some of the <coughs> Sherpas about it and, uh, and some of the expedition leaders too, and I think there's a feeling that there will be less people on the south side of Everest this year and maybe more on the north side. Um, I wonder how much of an impact that big Everest movie will have because it does, you know, Everest does hold this um, place in our imaginations and. And often, you know, the book, when it was released at the time, John Krakow's book, after the big disaster in 1996, on which that Everest movie's based, it, um, you know, it, practically within two years, it tripled the number of people that were going to Everest. So I wonder if the Everest movie will have a little bit of that impact. I think, I think certainly things changed, and history was made last year in the Sherpas taking a stand. It hadn't happened before. I think they surprised themselves. Um, they realised perhaps they had more power than they had realised. No, they weren't, and so that's a really significant cultural thing, and in fact that's probably the main reason that's really spooked Purbatashi into not climbing anymore, because he's, as he gets older, he's, I've known him for 10, 11 years, and he's become increasingly um, devout, and he said to me, you know, the idea that it's one thing that, I know my limits, I can climb Everest, it's not a big deal, but it's the ice fall and the the fact that something might happen that I can't control and the fact that my body would be there and my family couldn't get it is that I just can't take that risk anymore.
like it's that. so it's There's all no run by expedition leaders. Some yeah. of them foreign, some of them locally operated. So there are local. There are operators, local operators, and unfortunately, I mean, even um, there was a uh, Sh uh, an expedition leader, Darwin Stephen Sherpa, who's a Sherpa. Mm -hmm. He's half Belgian, um, and he owns uh, Asian Trekking, and he, you know, he and Russell and and a number of the other, even the Sherpas will say it's unfortunately some of the Nepalese operated companies that are ones that are have the worst working conditions for their shirts, yeah. pay them the worst and, and actually, you know, guys like Russell actually do really look after their Sherpas. And guys like Russell, I mean, he's, he's not getting any younger. Sure. Um, so I think things will slowly change. Well, I mean, that raises the question, you know, is the only economy that, that they can hope for around an expedition economy or, or is there any hope for doing something else? Uh, not if they stay in that area. So like they are really, I mean, there's no motorbikes, there's no cars, there's no, you know, literally everything is on foot. And so other than just basic trade, which is, you know, yaks and potatoes and salt, um, then no, really. It's tourism, trekking, and, and hopefully, you know, for the Sherpas, it, it does mean more ownership. Let me uh, ask you this, Jennifer. I mean, can you talk about just the practicalities of filming at, uh, at, at high altitude? I mean, I, I know just filming in the city, <laughs> what those challenges are. And, uh, uh, but you know, what, when you're carrying all your gear up there and uh, you know, having to copy drives or you know, whatever it is you do to protect your footage, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it, it, to start with that, it's the, the data wrangling. I mean, when I, when I was um, camera operating on Everest and other mountains, it was in the days of tape, which was a lot easier. You know, you just chuck your tape in your pocket and you click the thing over and I mean, it's stuff like lenses, they fog up if you go in and out of tents, there's um, batteries, it's cards, the lack of power, because um, we had three main sort of cinematographers on the trip, plus I ended up operating plus the two Sherpas, and um, there was a lot of, a lot of data, basically, and GoPros and all sorts of things, and so um, the data wrangler was just going over time, and the issue for him was A, the cold, and B, uh, the lack of power, so we tried to do as much as he could with solar power. It's uh, a rare chance to come and uh, be with Jennifer Pedum, who's normally in Australia. She's here just for a day or two. We're very grateful to have her here. Thank you for being here uh, and come back again.